backwards, and boom, brand new record player. This Project Debut 3 has a very special story. This was given to me by the record shop Grown and Sewn. They gave it to me as a fixer upper project. I was in the market for a new record player anyway, and they thought it'd be cool for me to try to breathe new life into it. I've always been fascinated by record players and how they work, especially taking into account the time period of when they were invented. The technology is mind blowing. Let's take a look what was wrong with it and how we're gonna fix it. Trust me, this one is satisfying. Before we get into the repair, let's dive into how record players work and why they are just such a cool feat of engineering. Every part plays a critical role. So we have the stylus, cartridge, tone arm, platter, belts, motor, counterweight, spindle and bearing, a preamp, and the feet. The stylus is that tiny pointed tip that sits in the groove of the vinyl record. As the record spins, the grooves guide the stylus, causing it to vibrate. These vibrations are a physical representation of the sound waves recorded onto the vinyl. Cartridge. The cartridge converts the vibrations of this stylus into electrical signals. This tone arm holds the stylus and cartridge, ensuring they move smoothly across the record. The tone arm balances weight and applies the correct tracking force to the stylus. This counterweight at the back ensures it doesn't press too hard or too lightly on the record, which can cause damage or poor sound quality. Platter. The record sits on this plate, and that's what spins around. This allows the stylus to read the grooves correctly. Now, this is a belt drive turntable. The belt here transfers motion from the motor to the platter. The motor, consistent rotational force. Now, anti-skate mechanism. This prevents the tone arm from being pulled inward. It applies a slight outwards force, keeping the stylus centered in the groove for consistent sound quality. Spindle and bearing supports the platter. The spindle is the central post that holds the record in place. And the bearings reduce friction, allowing the platter to spin smoothly without any added noise. This preamp boosts the signal from the cartridge to a level that could be sent to a speaker, such as my soundbar and subwoofer. The signal produced by the cartridge is very, very weak. It's called a phono signal. What the preamp does is that converts it and it boosts it to a level that could be sent to speakers. I have this routed to my soundbar and the wireless subwoofer. The feet and the isolation. Many turntables have adjustable shock absorbing feet to prevent vibrations from affecting playback. These are especially important if your turntable is on a surface that vibrates easily like being near speakers. What was wrong with this record player is that the motor was busted. It was very, very noisy. Sometimes it would stop rotating in the middle and then speed back up. And most times it would actually start spinning backwards. I called a few different record shops. They were charging a bunch of diagnostic fees. I said, you know what? By process of elimination, it seemed like this was just a motor issue and I had to replace it. When the guys downstairs gave me this record player, it was just the player itself and the power cable. I had to get a plastic cover. I had to get the hinges for the plastic cover to sit on. I had to get a slip mat. I had to clean it up from all the dust. And then lastly, I had to replace the motor. It was a really, really fun fix up project. Let's see how we replace the motor on a Project Debut 3 turntable. This motor replacement tutorial is gonna apply to all of these models that you see here on the screen. Let's do it. I ordered the replacement motor from analogseduction.net. They're based in Europe, but the part arrived pretty quickly. I ordered the motor, the hinges, and the plastic cover all from there. Very reliable shop. Okay, let's take off the lid, take the record out, slip mat, rubber belts, spindle, counterweight. We're gonna flip this over. We're gonna unscrew the hinges that hold the lid in place. Flip that upside down carefully. Now we're gonna grab our screwdriver. We're gonna unscrew the plastic coverings. Now we're going to want to take a picture of the configurations of the wire just so we know the order that we're going to want to solder back into place with. So here I'm using the soldering iron to heat up the previous solder just so I can safely pluck out those old wires from the previous motor. We'll take our screwdriver and now we're going to unscrew the casing from the motor itself. Now this part here has a little screw that tightens itself onto the motor. We just want to unscrew that with the tiny flathead screwdriver. A bit stubborn sometimes. We're going to pop that off. Just pops right off. Set that off to the side. There's the casing. Now we are all done with the old motor. We'll set that off to the side and grab our new motor. Old. New. Now we're gonna attach the plates back onto the motor. 
we're going to do this in the exact reverse order that we just took everything out. And you're going to want to make sure that this tiny flathead screw here is as tight as possible because that is attaching onto the motor itself. So if that is loose, it's not going to spin properly. We want to make sure it's tight onto the motor. Now the band that suspends the motor above the ground to prevent vibration, that actually snapped while I was taking it out. I didn't even notice until I went to go put the new motor back in, but I improvised. I found a rubber band that was about the same size, looped it under the base plate, and it worked just fine. So that's why you see the rubber band there, when it should be the original black band that's off to the side here. It snapped. Oops, it happens. I'm going to use a soldering iron to heat up all the previous solder, just to ensure that there's enough room for the wires to be touching the metal. There's a lot of extra solder there from the last time, so I'm just heating it up, melting it away, so we have a fresh, clean slate to work with. I use a screwdriver to poke a hole through the solder, and clear it all out. Now, referring back to the photos that I took earlier, I know that the red one is first, the yellow and white go together in the middle, and the blue is at the bottom. I fed the wire through the hole and curved at the end so it stayed in place by itself. On my left hand, I had the lead-free solder. On the right hand, I had the soldering iron. And from there, I was able to melt the solder and successfully attach that wire to the power source. I repeated this process two more times by soldering the white and the yellow wires in the center and the blue wire at the bottom. It was surprisingly easy for a beginner. I freaking did it. I was super pumped about my ability to solder for the first time. Now we're just going to put all the casings back together. We're going to do everything in reverse now. Put the casings back on, put the spindle back in, rubber belts, platter, slip mat. We're going to attach the hinges for the cover back on, put the counterweight back on, and the lid back on. Let's go test it out. Much better. Not bad for a beginner, huh? I have no experience at all with soldering or electrical. Honestly, it was pretty straightforward. From there, wiped it clean from dust, and boom, brand new record player. And because of the generous guys at Grown Tone, I was able to start my record collection and actually develop a passion for having this physical medium of music. I love it. This project was a really rewarding experience. I'll link all the tools and the parts you're gonna need if you're gonna be replacing this motor. If you found this helpful, please like, comment, subscribe, share with a friend. I answer every single DM, I answer every single comment. I appreciate you all. See you next week.